Welcome everybody, welcome back. So happy to be here with you. And I'm especially very happy to be here today with our guest of today. So I'll just introduce Sunita for a little while and then we'll bring her online to share. So Sunita Mba, who, as I said previously, is a beautiful young woman who I've known for probably around 10 years now. So a real honor for me is combining her role at the Pocket Project, where she is our social media coordinator with her master's in World Heritage Studies. Sonita is a passionate food grower, permaculture designer, and facilitator. For over 10 years, she was the co-creator of Better World Cameroon, building a whole network, especially with young people across Cameroon, and co-initiator of Bafut Eco Village, an off-grid learning center in Cameroon. As Executive Secretary of the Global Ecovillage Network Africa, she brings regenerative community and social enterprise development to several African communities and countries. In 2017, Sunita received the Gender Just Climate Solutions Award by the Women and Gender Constituency of the UNFCCC for empowering women. Driven by her passion for healing colonial trauma, Sunita took the principles of collective heal trauma healing course with Thomas Hubel and is continuing to travel and learn and teach with us. So Sunita, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm really happy to be here with you. Yeah, maybe you want to share just, you know, as you started out as a young woman and co-creating Bafut Eco Village and Better World Cameroon, what were some of your dreams and what were some of the wonderful things you built in Cameroon? Thank you very much, Kasha. And yeah, happy to be here with everyone. So my biggest, biggest dream has been to yeah, to support young people um, to come alive in themselves, especially young, young Africans, because we have grown up and we were taught that we are less, we are less and less, and we are never more of ourselves. And I have grown up in a, yeah, in a continent where um, I have always felt that yeah, I'm not good enough and that um, it's a space of hunger and suffering. And we have grown as young people into this narrative, into our educational uh, system with that narrative. And so my biggest passion has been to support young people um, to live in that space in Africa, in Cameroon, and to use the potential that we have to design social enterprises that would support the systems around us, but also support us to grow and be more alive in ourselves. Um, and yeah, of course, in that journey as a, as a young woman as well, um, it's always a, a joy to support women and local women in communities because that in itself uplifts my soul. Um, and so that has, of course, been my journey. And, and that's why for many reasons, I'm also here talking to you today. Yeah, wonderful. And, you know, I was just so impressed also by the spirit of social entrepreneurship that you brought to regenerative agriculture, showing young people that we can heal the soil, heal the forest, heal ourselves, you know, while making an income, making a good living. And I know that also the way that you spread cooking stoves, a new form of building cooking stoves was incredibly efficient and in the end led to you receiving this award. So maybe just share a little bit more about that. Yeah. Okay, so um, 
first of all, of course, always there's a story around a certain initiative, no? So um, with agriculture, of course, there's this gap between the older generation and the younger generation where young people feel that, um, especially in Africa, that agriculture did not make our parents rich. Um, and so there was this kind of apathy for engaging in agriculture and as ambitious as we are, we did not find a space there. So that work has been about encouraging and empowering young people to invest into agriculture and to see the potential in the soil. Um, and that has been an, a very, very beautiful journey um, using permaculture to to regreen the environment and to support young people to create those green economic businesses. Um, and for the yeah for the the stove it's about like really seeing how um cooking is such a big thing in our culture and women have not been able to engage in leadership opportunities because they have to cook such long hours all the time um but also that women play a central core role um in the agriculture sector but also in um, regreening the forest. Uh, they are the ones going all the time to fetch wood, to fetch water. Um, so it was just natural that there is something which is this stove, it's an earthen cook stove that empowers women um, to create something, um, to create a solution, a technical solution that they are able to use uh, to facilitate the cooking process, but also to reduce uh, the amount of uh, wood that is outsourced from the forest um, and in turn to yeah to regreen the environment and to support their communities and i remember when i came to visit you in the project you know just how incredibly beautiful the space was and we spoke to Sabine Lichtenfels last Saturday about healing biotopes and truly the food eco-village was a healing biotope, watching young people flower into their power, into leadership roles and you know, also watching you being called forth by the elders as a young leader in the bigger community that you were part of. And I remember that you and I had conversations with the mayor of Bafut about transitioning not just the part of the city, Bafut is a city made up of 52 communities um, to an eco-village, but actually he had the vision of then transforming this whole area of 52 villages you know apologies if if i'm out <laughs> by one number but you know just an amazing vision of transitioning this whole area to an eco city which was so inspiring and we were kind of poised with the african eco village network with you with all the skills of many people from the network behind you to move into that bigger transition and then the civil war hit in Cameroon. And I'm sorry to, you know, for yeah, the pain that is inevitably touched when we speak about that. But I think it's so important for those of us that are in safe places that we understand the fragility um, that is often experienced in many places in the world. Yeah, it's not um, an easy topic to talk about for me because it's still very fresh wound. Um, so yeah, it was, as you said, Kasha, it was the most amazing space to be in because of not only the flourishing of humans, but also of uh, the environment, the birds, the plants and everything was just was just beautiful. And it was really, really, really amazing to see um, that when we plant a tree in and in the next couple of years, what it actually becomes and that joy to harvest from the seeds of what you have planted. It was just incredible in that young people were also starting to see that it's not just about wanting it now, it's about the patience to reap the harvest later. Um, and for that to be cut short, 
um, was a, a, a very, very big pain. Um, so um, I, I actually think that when that when climate change hit, that it's not just um, about um, yeah that so many forests are lost, but also that people's lifestyles um, and that our communities we tend to lose our communities, we lose our land, um, and in this case, of course, it's it's something engraved in colonialism and the colonial rootedness of of the past um, that caused the war anyways that i have now and many other people we have lost our community um, um and we've lost this place this birthplace and and i would say it's a place that reconnected me to my roots and what is what for me like yeah, finding solutions and technical solutions to solve climate change is about reconnecting to our roots and doing those things, little solutions that ensure and support the environment to grow. And at this point, we cannot do that anymore. And, and of course, when, when war comes in through the door, climate change kind of goes off through the window, no? because there are many other pressing issues that we have to solve. Um, and for many of us, when the war hit, and our community was taken the community was burnt down um by the military um yeah and so we were kind of evicted you know also like the animals like extinction rebellion um in a way so we got extinct from our community and that in itself is also realizing the deep pain um of where we are in our world um, not only from from climate change, but also from every other thing around climate change um, that creates difficulties. Yes, and as you say, and again, you know, I, yeah, just how the continuing tensions after colonialism play into this, you know, not just in the creation of the civil war, but then also the way it is held, the way we heard so little and we still hear so little about the situation in Cameroon in the world news, the way that there is so little protection for you and your friends and your communities, you know, and so many young people with high levels of knowledge around nature conservation around care have had to flee or have lost their lives so such a loss upon loss upon loss of goodwill of rootedness of love for place of love for community of networks of friendships of family it's just it's overwhelming in a way you know and i think that is part of why we are here today to speak out about the huge role that trauma, individual ancestral collective trauma plays in the topic of climate change and how without addressing all of this, we cannot find the solutions. Yeah, and on a concrete level, you know, just coming to COP26 here um, and coming to the fact that voices like yours have such a hard time really being heard at the table, you know, and I know that you had an invitation by the women and gender constituency to come, they pay, you know, they offered to pay for all your costs and you have all this official backing even, and then what happened? Yeah, and then I, uh, yeah, I mean, like we know that um, it's not climate, only climate change we're suffering from, we are also suffering from an inequality crisis. Um, and so when I submitted the documents at least two months before or two and a half months before to the UK um, immigration and, and I had also, I needed some time also to rest after so many years of work without any rest. Um, however, um, yeah, the documents didn't come back. My passport didn't come back. It took two months, um, even though it was said that it only takes 15 working days um, to get this, this visa. Um, so consequently, I couldn't go to COP. Um, 
However, I also made several phone calls, which I was charged like, I don't know, 50 euros for it. In the end, no one answered the call, but I was charged for it. Um, well, whatever. What I know is also that in 2017, you know, when I won this award, I also didn't get a visa to come to Germany to Bonn um, in, in 2017, where I had to receive the, the award. Um, so what this also makes me realize is that uh, more and more we are told that we have a seat at the table. But when we don't even know if that table actually exists, if you don't even let us in, then what seat do we have? Um, and when we talk about negotiating uh, for the climate, who is actually sitting on that seat? And if there is no equality of the negotiation that actually we are all sitting on that table and talking about the climate, then how is that even possible that we would reach a resolution? And of course, we know that so many communities in, um, in the South and in the Global South are suffering even more from climate crisis, even though we are the least polluters and emitters of carbon. But we also don't have the space um, to sit on those tables, especially youth and women, to actually talk and negotiate. And the biggest slogan um, yeah, of the UNFCCC and the different UN platforms is that leave no one behind. But that I don't think this is true because we are every day leaving so many people behind. And in whatever way, I mean, in so many different ways, also the people in, um, in the Amazons in different parts of the world are not being included um, in the climate negotiation. And, and these anyways, essentially is, um, leaving out essential voices of the people actually doing the work on the ground um, in different communities. And that even have the potential to bring and to inject beautiful energy, energy of abundance and beautiful spiritual energy of great work that is coming from those spaces and actually missing the chance of sharing how hard climate change is hitting in those different places. So it's, it's very, very sad actually. Yes, I think we couldn't agree more. And I see the impulse here in the chat to say, oh, you could try this, you could try this, you know, immediately this impulse to help and also knowing how many things were tried and from such high levels, you know, and that sometimes we think, oh, but this should be easy to solve. And it's not, right? We heard from some of our African brothers who were at COP, you know, and also they get their visa late and the accommodation here became more and more expensive. So when you wait a long time, once you finally have your visa, it's super expensive to pay for flights and accommodation here. You know, it's different than for people who can just book a year in advance because you know for sure you'll have the resources, you'll have the visa. But then also we see that those people who come late haven't had as much time to organize side events or places to get their voices heard well. And there's a whole structure in and around COP which makes it hard for people on the ground. Some of you might have been with us when we were doing a global social witnessing event about communities on the front line and we had the head of the delegation from Nepal speaking out really clearly that what she wanted to do was bring some of the voices from the people who'd actually experienced the monsoon floods and the wildfires but this is not how delegations are put together so those voices are really hard to come through. And I think that's part of what wants to shift. You know, maybe you could just say something more about the impact you would hope, you know, because it feels like many of the voices like you then go to the Extinction Rebellion or the Fridays for Future and come in as a protest. But so many of the young people would love to work within the system and bring their voices through. So, you know, what would you dream of, you know, for your youth voice, you know, for you as a real bridge builder, as somebody who deeply 
is embedded in and understands indigenous knowledge systems. What is that that you would like to bring forward? Yes. So I would love to see more clearly that the climate negotiations actually address, because I think that there is a gap between what is happening at the policy level and what actually happens on the ground. And of course, from my years of working um, on the ground in communities and building community and also participating in these high level political forums, I see clearly you know, this gap between what actually gets implemented on the ground and what is sitting there as policy in these high level political forums. So um, I know definitely that at home, what happens is that smallholder farmers are implementing real change by shifting um, the systems around their communities, the way that agriculture is being done. But also that at high level political forums, we are saying at COP, we need large scale agriculture that consumes genetically modified seeds that, you know, and all of this is not actually what gets transpired on the ground, that what really happens on the ground is that local communities are innovating solutions. And those solutions are not being taken over by the national government into the, these political spaces. This is what I would love to see, that the impact that the people are making on the ground, small or big, is very, very essential to drive the change that we need to see in the future around climate change. And my biggest hope is that our national government would take this into consideration and include it as part of their nationally determined contributions or um, as part of the, the direction going into the future and how clearly we can address climate change. And that this, of course, that there's a lot of aspects on this that is around adaptation, more adaptation solutions, more planting of trees. And this is different from what our governments want, which is more around machines and more technologies. And, and of course, these technologies are needed at a certain point for mitigation, mitigating solutions. But also adaptation solutions are what I see on the ground and what is being implemented every day. So my biggest wish is that, that the work that is happening on the ground is seen and is taken into consideration when the policy is being drawn. Wonderful, yeah, and maybe just to bring one example that I remember from, you know, driving through Cameroon, but not just Cameroon, but also other places in Africa where, you know, these tree planting um, ventures that come straight down from COP, for instance, you know, where then the government plants 3000 trees and they're planted right by the motorway so people can see them and see how well the government is doing but nobody is there to caretake these trees and when the drought comes they die and they're very small you know but if you give each household a tree to plant in their garden or the children at school and they start caretaking the trees, we have a completely different situation, which is what you're speaking about, you know, mm -hmm. and I remember, you know, how you and I used to work together and you continue this work in speaking to especially African governments, but governments around the world to also bring national eco-village development programs, really where governments work with their communities, with the power of community, the power of women and youth to transform bottom up rather than top down and to marry these approaches yeah so what is the next step for you and i know that you um you're studying world heritage studies in germany right now um what is your dream and how does that fit into what we're speaking about now I, well, I definitely think that the work is continuous. Um, and sorry for the so much noise here. Um, okay. Um, so I think that the work is constantly, it's always ongoing. And also as a permaculture teacher, 
um, certified permaculture teacher. I'm constantly um, teaching these courses around permaculture, and I do believe that such alternative approaches is what is needed to address climate change, but not only that, to address uh, our social problems, because climate change in itself is a social issue, and our habits and how we, we see and perceive things, which, um, for example, where we go to the supermarket, what we collect from the supermarket, how much plastic we collect, and all of this, it's, it's also a social habit. Um, so permaculture, in a way, is, is super essential in that process. In my study, is I see it as a way of understanding scientific processes and how those scientific processes are important um, in the work of local communities and how a local, to support local communities in understanding more uh, the scientific um, impact of the work they are doing, but also to support them in the assessment of the work they do. Because most, uh, most often the times, communities do a lot of work, but they're not able to account for um, how much carbon footprint they have and you know stuff like this so I think my work is to bridge that gap and to support communities because of course so many people are uh, yeah, not uh, educated at home but still they have the necessary knowledge to do the work and we can always as you say marry um, technology of today and the indigenous knowledge system. And that process is actually that adaptation of those technologies is what is really needed. And it has to be done by the people for the people. So I really believe that as African, I need to do this. I am committed to do this for my community. Um, but also that um, talking about trauma and the ongoing crisis in Cameroon, um, we don't know, of course, when it would end. But we know that we have hope that someday anything that has a beginning has an end. Um, and that by the time that happens, my study or part of my study is about finding ways of creating an alternative paradigm that in the case where the current paradigm crashes, we have the opportunity, the opportunity to inject into that space a new paradigm that would support the life, the thriving life um, that is existing there. Yeah, thank you so much, Sunita. It's, it's really, you know, and I think the appreciation here in the chat speaks for itself. You know, we're deeply honored to have you and deeply joyful to have you as part of our team in the Pocket Project. And also um, you're supporting us to increase our diversity and inclusion work and teaching us around that so just from my heart thank you so much for what you bring to us to the pocket project and for what you bring to the world and I think all of us here can just send you a breath of blessing and love may we be the wind under your wings and may we be looking at one of the future leaders. Thank you. Of this world. Thank you, Sunita. Thank you. Be Thank safe. You. Thank be you, well. all of you.